Okay, so now I'm happy to announce the, the first uh, speaker, which has been uh, chosen, elected by the program committee. And I have to look at my mobile phone. It's Markus Weber from KPN AS286. Um, I think the most of you know him. Uh, I, I spoke to him before, and uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not aware if he has worked for any other company than KBN, actually. Um, but I think he, he does, or he did. His talk is titled RTPH, RTSPH, RTST, RTSD COS. So quite fancy. He will tell us something about um, black holing and advanced black holing, selective black holing, fun stuff you can do to stop some bad packets toward your network. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, I know some of you, but uh, not all of you. How does that work here? Mouse button? Next. Ah, okay. Okay. As I just introduced, I'm Markus Weber. I'm 46, and that's reason I need glasses to read the screen here. According to the business card uh, I own, I'm a senior designer in network operations. And I work for KPN Eurings Germany BV, uh, also known as KPN, KPN Eurings or KPN International. Uh, we are the international business unit of the former Dutch incumbent called KPN. We do offer layer two, layer three VPN service and value added services mostly for Dutch national customers uh, with international requirements. Uh, we do sell as well waves on our own DWDM network and IP transit. The network we operate is AS286. We have footprints locations in uh, Europe, North America, and Asia. We are transit-free and mostly Juniper. So most of the examples I will show are on Juniper, but uh, we still have some legacy Cisco. Uh, in case that was too fast marketing for you, this will be an infomercial, this talk as well, and you see it in the lower right corner all the time, our AS number and the logo. And in case you is that too small, I even wear a shirt on that. Um, the, talk, uh, the, the title of the talk is RTPH, RTSPH, and RTS DCOS. Uh, the later one is just the naming I came up with. And um, if you look into the name, that's remote triggered black holding, remote triggered selective black holding, and remote triggered selective destination or dummy COS, or for the Cisco guys, QoS. Um, However, before jumping onto that, I must admit it's a bit of reinventing the wheel. And all I'm going to talk about is really old. And let me repeat that it's really old. Uh, when I started doing that, uh, I thought, well, this is fancy what I'm trying to achieve here. Um, then I compiled the talk and uh, submitted it. Oh, no, I first submitted it to the committee. Then I did some in the net, something in our network. And uh, then I compiled here the uh, slide deck and uh, did some more research in the internet and found out, hey, a guy of cult, uh, Niklas Fischbach, mentioned that already in the talk in 2002 on a Black Hat conference. So I was pretty upset on my own, not doing that research earlier. However, I'm pretty sure that uh, more than half of the people here probably never have thought of doing so. Uh, but I'm in good company. Um, Selective black holing, as you might have heard by Job Snyders, um, is something old as well. Uh, it's more or less mentioned in a Cisco paper uh, published 2005 about black holing, uh, which already mentions the idea of having regional black hole targets. And uh, at the last RIPE meeting, uh, there was a talk by a French guy called ABH, um, and that, if you read that carefully, it's more or less RFC 5635, applied to the sinkhole mentioned in 3882. So I'm in good company, but don't get me wrong, I don't want to make any one of them look bad. Often it's just uh, the idea got forgotten or it's missing just an example or others doing it, making you do that as well. So um, we're going to talk about old things, uh, repeating, and maybe it adds some new ideas. And even though you might use it for something else, it's always nice to see what others do. Um, yeah, just the reference. And we're going to start with a small network. Uh, it's very confidential. Uh, looks like that. You have three boxes always serve in the future examples as uh, ingress boxes. And the lower right will be uh, an egress box as well. Um, 
Now you might ask yourself, is that my network, is it new, new network? Most examples uh, will be from my perspective, so me as transit provider offering the opportunity or the possibility to trigger that in my network, but you could do that in your network as well. And if you can, let's say, uh, have sufficient upstream capacity and willing to pay for that and your upstream can handle the load, it's always smart to do it, to it, to do it in your network because you have way more insight in what's happening than when you do it in some other networks. So we put some traffic on the networks, nothing fancy. The green traffic will be the one we will focus on, and the blue one is just I needed a collateral damage uh, victim, so I added something. Now the flooding starts, and uh, you see some green uh, the green traffic gets some attack traffic as well. So you have uh, valid traffic and bad traffic, and if things go stuck, Ah, if things go really bad, your AS explodes. Most likely, it's your uplink being uh, overloaded. Eventually, your router, uh, your software router, can't handle the packet load or the amount of traffic. So this is a problem. What you usually do then, and uh, it's nothing new, nothing fancy. It's black hole. It's you tell me. Uh, and when I say you, it's uh, the AS6551 uh, example. You tell me to black hole the traffic, and I do then discard on all ingress boxes the traffic immediately rather than sending you. That's nice, that brings you, your network back, but you don't get any traffic for the green, neither the good, neither the bad one. And you have no clue when the attack is over because uh, you don't get any traffic. So to see if the attack is over, you take the risk by removing the black hole and eventually you will have the issue with your overloaded uplink as well. Again. Um, you can do the black holing in some places rather than asking me to, to drop it everywhere. You could just ask me to hey, drop it on IN3 and not on the uh, uh, to drop it on IN1 and 2 and not on IN3. When you do selective black holing, you always have to think yourself, ask yourself uh, in certain scenarios, what does it mean? Now we have here the case that IN1. Uh, is using IN2 box as transit box to reach the egress. Uh, and that depends then on your network. If you use MPLS, the traffic from IN1 going through IN2 will be label switched, so it will not be black holed, and then it will pass by. If you do a per hop lookup, your traffic will be dropped on IN2 as well, coming from IN1. So, yeah, you can get something working there, but it's not always that uh, straightforward. And if you do something very stupid, uh, you do the dropping on the egress box, which uh, is more or less useless, which upsets just me because I have to carry all the shit up to the egress box and then drop it there and not get any money back from you for doing so. Now let's ask, is maybe less better? And with less is, the situation was here that the uplink was overloaded. Just take it for now, this one. Um, why not, and we have seen customers asking us, to place a rate limit for traffic destined towards one box uh, towards the destination IP address to rate limit the traffic for that box to avoid an overload. Um, that looks not bad. And if you look, you have now here uh, almost half of the green traffic is still coming through, but don't, don't think that will work. Even though half of the traffic gets through, you still have 50% traffic loss in that example. And um, if you think of attack ratio between normal traffic ratio, it will be even worse. So it might not work. Uh, but your network is still working. Um, the nice thing on that is you could do still some analysis on the traffic coming in. So you could, uh, if you have not taken any traffic traces before, or don't have any flow data available to do some analysis and your upstream is not helping you or your peering partner, um, then you can still do some analysis and maybe ask for some advanced filtering stuff like there, so manual stuff. Um, and when the attack is over, if the rate limit is well chosen, it might recover on its own. So let's, let me try to reuse that information, which I just use on the egress, however I implemented that, on the ingress side. And um, I'm pretty sure most people now think immediately, this is what flow spec is for. You place some rate limits in your network all over, and you are done. That was something I wanted to avoid. Um, I have my concerns against flow spec. I, I will do it sooner or later and make it available. But um, at that point in time, I was, uh, it was a clear no to do so. Further, just when being, uh, talking about flow spec is 
um, flow spec is on the edge. So if you have run an MPLS backbone, you might rate limit all the traffic coming in on every edge, but it might, will still sum up on your backbone. So if you have 30 links ingress um, on the box, you will get 30 times the amount of traffic in theory if coming in from all the ingress, uh, ingress links uh, in your core you have to handle. Um, just a note on J, uh, at the moment it's V4. Uh, luckily, it seems that 16.1 supports V6 as well. And with uh, the former example of selective black holing again, think very carefully where the filters are being applied. Juniper uh, at the moment pushes out on all interfaces, and I do have a bad feeling having those filters implemented and used on the core-facing interfaces of my boxes, but uh, it's a personal thing. Uh, getting back to the how to reuse that information I used on the egress before to rate limit somewhere on the ingress side. Um, and that's where the cost part comes in. Um, I know which destination you consider as being attacked. And at that moment, I can, whichever way I do that, mark that traffic look brighter. So just think of the normal traffic as normal colored and everything under attack or you tell me to do so will become brighter. So I have now brighter traffic. And on that brighter traffic, I can filter. I can rate limit, I can make look it bad or worse than the other traffic. Um, that works for V4, V6 nicely, uh, and I can use that information on MPLS as well. I can make use of that information now in my core, rather than uh, like if with Showsplack, where you can't use that. I could, for instance, handle that traffic in my core as in a scavenger class. A scavenger class is treat that traffic worse than any other traffic. So every bandwidth which is remaining will be given to that uh, traffic, but if you have other traffic, it will be served first. Um, which makes a bit monitoring of full links a bit harder because you now don't have to look only at the uh, bandwidth being used on the full interface, you would have to distinguish between traffic class types uh, you transport over that link. But it works. Um, if you really want to avoid overloaded links by bad traffic, you could even rate limit on that. Or make a rate limit scavenger class, which means kind of uh, never give more than 50% of the bandwidth of that link to that. And in case the link is loaded with other traffic, uh, don't give it to that as well. Um, but don't fool yourself. If you think of flow spec, you always have kind of a source destination. You have a filter, so it's a bit flow oriented, uh, flow focused. Uh, with that, it's not. Uh, and if you think of that scenario, your green service is under attack, you still have the blue, and now someone threatens to attack the blue as well, you might think it's a smart idea to put the uh, blue traffic as well in the marking for uh, rate limiting. And that will make you look bad, because uh, marking puts every traffic into one class, so it's only bright traffic. It's not bright traffic to green, it's not bright traffic to red, uh, to, to blue, it's bright traffic. So when you would do that, you would immediately see some packet loss on the blue service as well, even though not attacked. So you have to be careful about that. You can do that selective as well, that's where the S comes in. Um, and here is again an example for an MPLS network. Um, so you only mark the traffic coming in on IN2, that's the lower left box, uh, to be rate limited eventually, and uh, the re remaining traffic will be handled as usual. You can combine both selective methods. Um, so you can do black holing on one box and marking and rate limiting traffic coming in from another box, and on a third box you can handle it as usual, normal. Um, now let's get a bit technical and remote triggering. Remote triggering is yeah, don't log in on every box. So in theory, you could do it with scripting, you could do it with netconf or stuff like that. Um, all these examples will be based on BGP with community signaling. For black holing, uh, a dedicated box sometimes works out as well nicely because it does not depend on your network connection. Um, but uh, yeah, BGP is the most commonly used one. Um, remote triggered black holing. Uh, quite straightforward, it's well known, so this is the only slide about that. It's to modify the next hop of the prefix to point to another next hop in your IBGP, which goes to some dev null interface uh, or discard or DSC interface. Um, 
A hint, sometimes it might be useful to use multiple different black hole next hops in your network, because if you have flow data, you can monitor uh, parallel attacks and see which one is over and which one is still ongoing. It's pretty, pretty straightforward to implement, still some room if you try to rewrite the next hop in Juniper and Ingress, you might have some fun with that. Uh, which brings us to RTSBH, so Remote Triggered Selective Black Holing. Um, when Yo promoted that in 2014, he came up with the theorem, most prefixes content have a geographical significance which decreases as distance between the sender and receiver increases. In other words, if you run a German website hosted somewhere in Germany, you probably not, Chinese traffic is probably not that significant to you. Um, which always which kind of makes it regional thinking, but it might even make sense if you have just two boxes in your network and you see the major majority of attack traffic or bad traffic is coming in one box, you might just black hole it selectively on some places. Uh, you implemented uh, that uh, by using distances uh, as criteria for where to black hole or where not to black hole and uh, use the normal IBGP mesh for signaling. Um, as the Netherlands, our primary market is pretty small, and if you do a 500 kilometer around Amsterdam, you black hole complete Amsterdam, which was too coarse for us, so we need some more fine-graded stuff. And uh, therefore, we implemented a slightly different logic, which is uh, black hole on ingress, uh, black hole the ingress traffic on some selected, so you have the possibility to black on any pop where you want, or you do it around the PE you're connected, around the city, around the pop, the city, the country, the continent, and then you can whitelist again certain pops. Um, it's a bit more complex, but allows quite some tweaking. Uh, but we had our challenge with that. Uh, and the biggest one, which was not, not the first one, is we have a great design of our network. We have route reflectors in the forwarding path. So, um, and that makes it hard for rewriting the next hop if you need the original next hop in another place uh, which uh, of another route reflector client. Uh, you can fix that uh, for sure by finally cleaning up your design uh, or you could uh, do some naughty tricks by not replacing the next hop in the rip but in the fib, uh, which is then fun if you have to troubleshoot that with your first liner or your first line tries to troubleshoot that and looks in the rip and says, well, it's, it's in there, it should work, but uh, something else is in the fib. Um, the initial one, and that's the funny one, uh, some people couldn't believe that, we don't have any route maps with continuous statements in our network. And uh, um, that was for me kind of, yeah, that would be pretty long if I use that uh, Jobs uh, semantic there, and uh, that made me to think of an alternative. And what we ended up with is uh, kind of the right design and uh, even more separated from a right approach to design your network, and that is by introducing dedicated route reflectors just for the selective black holing signaling. And it was so great because it's completely separated from the complete normal IPGP mesh from the policies, and we have quite some internal policies uh, we use there. Uh, it's one place, uh, you can do nicely inject their routes as well, or you can log from there, um, and it turned out for us to be a good alternative. And you don't need much. Any small Cisco being capable of doing route reflection or any software implementation or a logical system on a Juniper would do that. You're not expecting hundreds of thousands of backhole routes. Um, and all we do there is uh, all validated uh, SPH announcement from customers. Uh, we never propagate through the IBGP mesh. You could still do that and override that by the uh, announcements coming then from the special uh, route reflector with a higher local pref, but we don't distribute it in the normal IBGP mesh and uh, only to the dedicated uh, route reflector. And uh, from the dedicated route reflector for the SPH uh, routes, um, we know where the announcement came from, we know the logic, what it means for that site to be a black hole outside the pop, outside the city, and then we can uh, push out the routes just to the PEs which need to know where to uh, uh, which need to know to black hole that. You could make uh, also another approach by still keeping the original next hop for the PEs not supposed to black hole, uh, but we opted against that. That's just the thinking of if you have uh, um, customer with multiple connections, if you start to announce a more specific on one connection, not on the other, you shift some traffic around there, and that what we wanted to avoid. But it's your choice. Uh, the same thing here as a picture. 
uh, yeah, just skip that over. Some, some configuration snipsets. Uh, not going to through that. We don't have the time. Uh, but it's in the presentation, and if you have questions uh, or find some typers, just let me know. One thing to mention on regional uh, black holing, selective black holing, is you might have a different understanding than me has. Uh, you might think often in geolocation stuff like uh, don't black hole everything outside Germany would give you the German traffic. Might be the case, but might be not, because for me, the significance is where the traffic is coming into my network, where are the interconnects. And I made an example of our own network, so I'm not making anyone else look bad. I guess there's just one other big doing that. Um, and that's a prefix originated out of the Netherlands with black hole outside the country. And you see that more or less works. You have some uh, fails. Uh, connection still from Belgium and from Germany. That's just those guys bring the traffic to the Netherlands and interconnect with us there. Uh, but it works. If you do the same thing in Spain, you will get all black. Why that? Well, we don't have any public interconnects to the network, to the internet in Spain. We use that just for VPN uh, termination on NNIs. So if you ever want to make that kind of a criteria to select your web your new upstream provider or peering partner, make sure you test it up front. Ask, what, ask for test IPs and ask for IPs to monitor that. Otherwise, you might get some surprises and not, the, not what you wanted. And another problem with selective black holing is, I know what you don't know. I know where the traffic came into my network. You don't see that unless I would share that with you in some graphs. Um, and... Uh, here, in this example, it's quite easy for me to see, okay, it's coming from, uh, from the West Coast and something from London, something from Frankfurt, but you don't have that information. And uh, we wanted to make that available, but then sometimes company policies about a single lock-on system and design prevents things from showing up in the real world. Um, so that's a big problem with selective black holding. Normally, if you're under attack, you, under, you are stressed. You don't have the time to play around to find the right combination to drop most of the black hole of the bad traffic. So this is a challenge. Which brings me now to RTSD costs. Remote triggered selective destination, or dummy, because it's just the basic of cost mechanisms or QoS mechanisms uh, class of service. Um, cost or QoS, Juniper prefers cost, uh, Cisco QoS. I'm not a friend of that. Uh, a lot of people aren't a friend of that, but it's around, it's being used, and it even might make sense. Um, I can tell you a story. 12 years ago, we had done horrible overloaded peering with some other incumbent, and we had problems getting that upgraded, and we had a lot of, so it was egress overloaded, and we had a lot of end users complaining, you suck. Uh, what to do, uh, you could do cost mechanisms, basic, very ba basic cost mechanism to uh, prioritize UDP and ICMP and 90% of the complaints will go away. Uh, just by them doing trace or MTR will not show up your hop as being the bad one or the link being the bad one that the traffic is dropped. Um, we are not doing that, we have enough cap uh, capacity these days, but uh, you can abuse such things. Um, one thing you must be aware of, doing cost is more than next hop rewriting. Uh, next hop rewriting is basic uh, BGP and forwarding stuff, um, but uh, cost or QoS is way more. Uh, higher hardware requirements and you might have some limitations. And if you want to do that in your complete network, so you want to make use of that in your core, you need a clean cost domain. So all the traffic must be correctly classified on the ingress and transport it in your network. Otherwise, you might have some strange effects if suddenly bright traffic gets normal color or normal traffic gets bright color, and then you might do stupid things. Um, now, I said we are Juniper, so I'm just giving you a short introduction into simplified uh, JCOS. Uh, what you do is on uh, ingress, you do some classification that might be on the interface where the traffic's coming in. You might uh, do some uh, checks on the cost bits, uh, so at the code points, or you might do even look into the packet header uh, for UDP ports or stuff like that. Uh, then you do some policing. Uh, when you do the classification, you associate the traffic with some uh, forwarding class in a Juniper called. Uh, this is just a different brightness of the traffic you could think of. So you could distinguish between different traffic type. You classified. Uh, then you do some policing. You do some queuing, shaping, scheduling, however you want to call that, and that's handling the traffic in the various different traffic classes um, 
depending on some criteria like load chatter, like uh, limited bandwidth, uh, prioritized traffic, uh, bigger buffers or not. Um, and then on the egress, you do rewrite, uh, this is setting the cost bits or the code points on the egress packet. Uh, and if you look at normal transit packets, cost life in, an, in our network, depending on what you use, it might look different, is on the egress, we just assign every packet from IP transit service to be best effort. Um, we keep that information, then we, it becomes an MPLS packet, so we have to set the uh, experimental bit or traffic class bit in the MPLS header, uh, we set that to zero, then we have to classify on the next hop uh, the uh, MPLS packet to be best effort, then we have to do that the same again, rewriting. Um, now we come to the penultimate hop, and there's important what you do. We do for IPv6, we do explicit null label signaling. For v4, we don't do, so uh, the last label will be popped on the, uh, uh, on the penultimate hop uh, PE for v4, so we have to keep in mind that we have to... Uh, that we have to set uh, now for the IP IPv4 packet, which is now native, no longer MPLS, uh, the IP precedence bit we use in the core IP precedence on the edge DSCP. Don't ask me why it is like this, like it is. Um, and then on the egress, you have to think of uh, doing the classification for all that. And then on the egress, you do uh, DSCP, and we use even other traffic laws then uh, for that. The idea, how I was brought by that was in the RFC 3882, there's mentioned kind of you could use sinkhole devices and you could apply rate limits on that. And uh, if you think about black hole de uh, sinkhole devices in a transit network, you do have a problem because either first the scale of the, and the num number of devices, either you have to transport the traffic somewhere to do that li rate limiting um, or you have to have to deploy a lot of boxes and I don't get any money for that. Um, so I was thinking about how to do that, and I don't know why it was came along that. And I can use cost mechanisms, the standard cost mechanisms, to achieve for destination IP traffic uh, a rate limit without any further boxes or stuff like that, or flow spec. And uh, the idea is, as on the previous slide shown, quite simple. Every normal traffic is best effort and the special traffic will be no effort traffic. So I will make, make that brighter. Uh, and then on the egress or even in the core, I use uh, scavenger class or I do rate limits. And for the signaling on the S part in the name, uh, I use the same as SBH. Some configuration, this is just the static part for doing the uh, classification, the standard classification, the rewrites. Uh, it's all in there, and I'm allowed to share that with you. Uh, even though this is very basic, you might want to do some smarter things there. The most challenging part is probably for most of you how to use that information which is coming from BGP to use that information to override the best effort default classification done on the ingress interface. And um, on Juniper, you find a few examples how to do that. On Cisco, you find way more. On Juniper, I left out something here in the uh, previous uh, slide on that, and that's called forwarding policy. And all you do on Juniper is uh, that um, in the forwarding table, when you import the data from your, or export the data from your RIP, you put some extra information in your FIP. And every time there's a route lookup, the classification override will take place. Um, yes, and it has no major impact. Uh, I loaded a full table for rewriting uh, with different class rewriting, worked without a problem, and even J Engineering confirmed it has insignificant impact. Uh, the memory requirements should not uh, do any harm, uh, should not be a problem, uh, and overwriting uh, is just some microcodes and uh, no impact set. The only problem on Juniper, on at least on everything up to 13.3, is uh, yeah, debugging on that. On the CLI, you hardly can, you, you can't see it at all, or at least I haven't found it, and Juniper hasn't shared anything with me. Uh, you can si see something on the line card, but uh, yeah. What about Cisco, you might ask, and uh, in the Black Hat presentation 2002, it was already in there. You find a lot of examples if you know what to look for. On Cisco, it's called QPPB. 
for cost policy propagation with or for or with we are by, by GP. I haven't tested in the lab, please forgive me. And the two magic things is on the BGP, um, there's a table map statement that is similar to what on Juniper is for the BGP rib to import in the FIP, you can do some magic. Uh, you could, for instance, limit it. If you operate a route server, instance, for instance, on a software-based router, you don't need all that information in the FIP. You could just exclude it from being pushed in the FIP and keep a default route in the FIP and only keep it in the RIP. But at the same time, you could set, for instance, the cost group on the, Juniper, uh, on the Cisco, or you can set the precedence bits. And then you reference that information in the Ceph forwarding information base uh, from your interface by using the BGP policy destination IP cost map or IP precedence map, um, and it works even for, supposed to work even for source IP address uh, referencing. Um, this example here leaves out all the magic uh, for using then the policy map to do the scheduling and uh, rate limiting. That's uh, backward. Um, cool. For sure it's fancy, and if you do some more fancy costings, you probably can do even more with that. And I dare to put the statement RTS DCOS is the better RTS BH. Why? Uh, it still protects your network from a severe overload causing big issues with you. It allows me to use that information in my core as well, while still giving you some packets to look at for further analysis. For sure, if you have automated systems in place, you probably don't need that. They might be even fooled or confused by that. But if you do a lot of things manually, uh, it might have an advantage on that. You might have an advantage. Keep in mind that the same with black holing, it doesn't help to restore the service. Your service will be still affected and not available in most cases till the end of the attack. And you might have some overlaps if you use that at the same time for, various, for, for multiple services. Um, and just a last reminder on that, don't underestimate cost setup and maintenance or hardware requirements on that. It's more than with black holing. And I don't want to compete with flow spec. It's a different story. If you have the choice flow spec or maybe something like that, I would always recommend to you use flow spec. You have way more things you could achieve with that. On the other hand, you can't protect your core with flow spec. You will still eventually face, depending on the filtering and what is getting through problems with bandwidth in your network, eventually. It all depends on what you have. Available, I wanted to re release it today, but uh, I'm basically lacking behind the annoying part, which is documentation and changing of delivery and uh, uh, monitoring stuff. Um, but uh, before Christmas, it will be available, available, and after that, I will go to flow spec. That's the end. Hey, I almost made it in time. It's amazing. Thank you. No more time for questions, I assume. Uh, I think we, <laughs> we can have two questions, <laughs> if there are questions. There is one. Yeah, Teos is 11 again. How much time did it cost to implement RTDSD costs in your network? Uh, to be honest, we had already some uh, costs in the backbone. So it was just adjusting that. Um, and to push out the configuration, I spent two afternoons. So it wasn't that big. Uh, I'm still lacking, uh, let's say, the, the customer facing ports, but I know all them. Uh, so it's just a script running over the network and pushing that out. Uh, if you don't have that, use, and if you have a mixed environment, you probably have a bigger problem to get all the uh, different vendors doing, doing the same stuff. No more? No questions? I'm shocked. Okay, then thank you, Markus. Yep.